Hi, my name is Justin Beck. I'm an instructor here at 343 Labs in New York City. And today I am here to talk to you about the basics of reverb. This is gonna be part one of a two-part video on the subject. The first part is just gonna be about covering the basics, you know, what the basic controls are, what the concept is behind it. And part two is gonna be about how to use it in a mixing and creative application in some more advanced ways. So I'm going to be using the stock Ableton Reverb to demonstrate the basic principles behind it because Ableton's Reverb has both basic and advanced settings and you can actually go quite a long way with it. And in order to demonstrate it, I'm just going to be using a basic snare sound. So Now, Reverb, in essence, is simply a way to imitate a sound being placed inside of a room. Traditionally speaking, the way that records were recorded was you used a microphone and you placed it up against the sound source and you recorded that. Something that would organically happen as a result of this is that the tone of the room and the acoustic properties of the room would come across in that microphone recording and it would lend actually to the sense of realness for the listener. And of course, across time, as we started moving towards computer-based music production, this is something that actually started getting lost a little bit. And so now we have a plethora of reverb plugins that give us options for different ways to model acoustic environments or to do things that actually weren't possible in the past and create new types of sounds and new types of soundscapes. And I'm going to be talking about how to do both of those in part two, but for now what we're just going to be doing is talking about the basics of navigating this seemingly simple but deceptively complex processor. So the very first thing we should look at is the dry wet knob. Uh, just like any other plugin, any other audio effect that you have, right? This is the ratio between the dry signal and the affected signal. And particularly when it comes to reverb, dry wet is very, very important. Because what this means to us is that dry is just this snare sound, and wet is this. And those are two very drastically different sounds, of course, right? So if we leave it at 50, for instance, we get a nice balance of the two. And so very early on, you know, getting your dry wet set is probably actually the first thing that I'm going to be doing when I open a reverb plugin. Now, the second most important parameter is decay time. Decay time, more than anything, is really going to affect the way that the reverb behaves and the way that the reverb kind of presents. So if I set my decay time to 1.2 seconds, what that means is after the sound first hits, it's going to echo for 1.2 seconds. Now, I say echo because actually that's what reverb is, right? It's really just a very, very quick series of echoes that are so fast that the ear can't really hear it, which actually takes me to the next parameter that is very important to talk about, which is pre-delay. Now, pre-delay is the amount of time it's going to take between the dry sound hitting and the wet reverb effect starting to occur. So at a very low setting, the dry snare sound and the reverb are kind of going to, what we would call, couple together and, and make a single sound. So this is very useful for sound design, for instance. But if we start rolling the pre-delay back, what you'll start hearing is that there will actually become eventually a very audible delay time between the snare hitting and the resulting reverb. It gets to the point where we kind of cross this line where the reverb stops seeming like it's part of the sound and it actually will start to seem like it's something entirely different, which as we'll discuss in part two, can be very useful and cool. But for our purposes right now, pre-delay is basically going to determine how deep into the room the sound appears. Now, the next setting we're going to look at is stereo. And in Ableton, the stereo is set to what we would call 100% at the moment. So even though it says 120, all that means is completely out wide, right? And believe it or not, the stereo profile of your reverb is extremely important when it comes to sound design and mixing. There's a very, very big difference between having the reverb occur out wide and having the reverb occur down the middle 
and we're going to get more into that in part two. But for now, I just want to demonstrate you know, the resulting difference between having it stereo and mono, and it really is quite a difference. So as you can hear, when it's fully stereo, the reverb is still just as deep as when it's mono, but the difference is, is that when it's stereo, it's kind of in your face. And when we have it completely down to zero, which we're gonna call mono, meaning just down the middle, it actually almost feels further away. And again, we're gonna get into that in greater depth in the next video. Now the last control that we're gonna talk about is size. And size is a very important control because what this is essentially gonna determine is the way that a sound echoes around a room. And if you've ever been inside of a very large church, you'll know that it's very, very different when you clap or say something loud than if you're in a small, tiny classroom, right? Or if you've been under a bridge. Size is basically supposed to imitate these different types of spaces. And as you'll hear, there's pretty drastic differences when we change the size. Now, I'm gonna change the size settings every time after I press pause, because this setting in particular actually creates a lot of digital like fracturing as the algorithm attempts to reprocess. I'll show you that in a sec, but first I just want you to be able to hear the organic results. So that's size at its basic setting. Let's move it a little smaller. Not hearing too big of a difference, so let's cut that in half. Now we're starting to get a little bit of a tighter sound. Now one thing you might notice as we get to that lower and lower setting is there actually starts to be more low frequency buildup in the reverb, which is something that's useful. And now something that you might not expect is that as the size gets smaller, you actually start to get a more reflective, shiny sound on the reverb. And what that actually has to do with is that we're literally imitating a sound echoing around a room so quickly that the echoes of the reverb start to actually clash with each other and build up and multiply. So on this lowest setting, we get this result. And it's actually quite metallic sounding in some way. So, you know, you can use that size setting to create sometimes kind of industrial or metallic noises. And so it's something that a lot of people don't explore, but it's very, very useful. And so just for the sake of example, if we pop in the other direction. We get a more exaggerated reverb profile, which almost kind of sounds like a small explosion or something. So just between these five parameters that I've showed you, you can dial in very, very complex reverb tones. Um, if you look across the top, right, there's some additional settings, and I'm not gonna dive into those right now. We're gonna talk about them a little bit more in part two, but I can assure you that you actually don't need to know too much about them to really create effective reverb tones. In fact, I very rarely am messing with those. Not because they're too complicated, but just because at the end of the day, they don't actually add so much more. So those are the basics of reverb. Again, my name is Justin Beck and I'm an instructor here at 343 Labs. We're an electronic music school based out of New York City and online. Please subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more tutorials and videos.